Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Crypto TV. I'm your host, Ornella Hernandez, here to talk about all things Web3 and crypto. Today we're talking about artificial intelligence and the rise of AI-related tokens, and about the latest news in the NFT world. We also have two special guests today coming on the show, so stay tuned. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is taking over the world, folks. It's everywhere, from music to movies, you name it. Now it's taking over crypto, and AI-related crypto tokens are up big lately. Let's get into it. Many AI tokens have posted significant gains over the last week. The market cap for AI tokens has jumped from $7 billion to $17 billion since the beginning of the month. Let's look at CoinGecko data. We can see that the market cap increased by 6% in the last 24 hours, and that IQ tokens and Singularity Net, or its AJAX tokens, are trending right now. Singularity Net's token has the fifth largest market cap at the moment, and they are the creators of the popular humanoids Sophia and Desdemona. Remember when I interviewed Desdemona, the pop star, not long ago? If you guys have not seen that video, then please make sure to check it out. It's a conversation you don't want to miss. And the link is in the description. Other tokens in the top five include BitInSource Tau, Render Token, Fetch.ai's FET, and Akash's Network, AKT. I actually recently interviewed Fetch.ai's founder, Humayang Sheikh, to discuss the intersection between blockchain and AI. So make sure to check out that conversation as well. The link is in the description. Now let's look at, we can see that AI tokens just hit their highest weekly trading volume in a year. And according to them, the uptick is due to OpenAI's announcement of its new text-to-video generator called Sora. The last big pump was at the beginning of 2023, right after OpenAI released ChatGPT, the product that put the AI narrative back on the map. Have you guys checked out Sora yet? I mean, these videos are very, very realistic. Stunning, truly. Take a look at these videos that OpenAI tweeted. In this first one, they prompted Sora with a beautiful snowy Tokyo city. The camera moves through the bustling city streets, following several people enjoying the beautiful snowy weather and shopping at nearby stalls. Or look at these giant woolly mammoths. Or this animated cartoon of a little monster looking at the candle. Pretty cool, right? Well, why does this even matter? It's not like it's Netflix quality yet. I think that it actually could eventually be. This is just version numero uno, and I'm sure that the next few iterations will be even more impressive. I mean, take another of OpenAI's products as an example, Dolly, the text-to-image platform. It's come a long way since it first came out 15 months ago, and it's now in its third iteration. So Sora will likely improve with time as well. And it makes me believe that AI-generated movies really are possible and coming in the near future. Other more immediate use cases for Sora could include B-roll slash stock video, video ads, video editing, all using AI. And Sora doesn't just do text to video. It can bring still images to life as video, extend videos in either direction, edit them by altering styles and environments, or even merge two videos. For now, the new generative model is only available to cybersecurity researchers to assess critical areas for harms or risks, as well as to select designers, visual artists, and filmmakers to gather feedback on how to better and improve the model. In addition to Sora, another product that launched earlier this month is the new Apple Vision Pro. Projects like Victoria VR that allow gamers to explore a photorealistic metaverse in 3D is building its metaverse app with tokens that is compatible with the Apple headset. So it's not exactly AI, but it's just making more people curious about it and optimistic about the crypto market. And on top of all of this, Ethereum's founding father Vitalik Buterin recently penned a blog post titled The Promise and Challenges of Crypto and AI. In it, he talked about how AI can help tackle some of crypto's 
biggest problems. He even included a Venn diagram to show the synergies between AI and blockchain, which highlight data ownership, monetization, transparency, and some other factors. So this blog post and all of the new products coming out just brings more attention to the AI sector and gets people talking about it and jumping on the bandwagon, which then trickles down to the AI token market. And it doesn't look like the AI token hype train is stopping anytime soon. And why is that? Two words, my friends. NVIDIA earnings. NVIDIA is a giant chip maker who recently released its better than expected earnings and posted its revenue of $22.1 billion. You see, the top AI tokens' performances have been correlated to NVIDIA's performance since January 2023. So some of the tokens that I mentioned before, FET, Render, Ajax, all surged after the earnings report was released earlier this week. Have you guys already invested in any of these? If so, please let me know and share some tips while you're at it. Now, moving on to another topic, NFTs. I want you guys to look at these images. How much would you pay for these? Because someone just paid nearly $15 million for this collection of 10 NFTs. These artworks are called autoglyphs, which was the first on-chain generative art created on the Ethereum blockchain. The 10 Autoglyphs NFTs sold for 5,000 ETH, which is worth $14.5 million. The brokerage that sold them is called Fountain, and after the sale, they posted on X the details of the deal. According to them, the collection was minted originally in 2019 by Larva Labs. They are the creators of CryptoPunks, who then sold to Yuga Labs. Larva Labs were like the OG NFT project and Fountain didn't disclose who bought it and they simply said that it was a distinguished private collector. They also said that it's one of the top NFT sales ever recorded on chain. This is true. It has now become number six with its $15 million price tag. We can see on this chart of most expensive NFTs in the world that it now sits at number six after two Murat Pack works, two people works, and a CryptoPunk. It might seem crazy, but that's the art world for you. Another crazy headline that had the NFT world in a frenzy recently was Yuga Labs' acquisition of Proof. It became apes versus moonbirds, or at least that's what it felt like after all of the backlash that the creators of Board Ape Yacht Club NFTs endured after acquiring Kevin Rose's NFT company. Proof. Let's see what some people were saying. Danny Green, who used to be the brand lead for MeBits NFTs at Yuga Labs, said, this makes no sense. Instead of investing in its own brand, i.e. MeBits, why is Yuga buying more Web3 collections? How does this help Yuga figure out product market fit, generate revenue, or clarify its business model? Adam Hollander wrote, I fucking hate this. Great for Moonbirds holders who wanted an exit. Nothing wrong with them celebrating it. But Moonbirds has been one of the worst run projects in the history of NFTs. They made close to $100 million and didn't follow through on their promises. They were supposed to build a metaverse world and then canceled it. They guaranteed IP rights to holders and then stripped them away without asking. It was an absolute mess. Kevin doesn't deserve to be rewarded publicly like this for it. And now he gets to be an advisor to Yuga? When Yuga is already under fire for not listening to its own community? I'm going to go calm down, but my initial reaction is fucking sell everything. And Yuga needs a new CEO. So basically, apes are upset in the same way that children might be upset at their parents for having more kids when all that they really wanted was more attention on themselves. But instead, the parents, or Yuga Labs in this case, just keeps adopting new kids or NFT collections. So it's hard for apes or CryptoPunks or MeBit holders to see how this acquisition will support the existing ecosystem. Now, not everyone is so upset though. Some users like Lior said that Yuga is establishing itself as the LVMH of Web3. That's Louis Vuitton, Moe, Hennessy, and quite a compliment in my opinion. They acquire foundational assets and brands that grow the space as a result. If they're able to run each of those brands separately from each other, it will be massive. Power moves. Now we execute. The latest in this story is that Yuga Labs did get a new CEO. 
BAYC co-creator and Yuga Labs co-founder Greg Solano, aka Crypto Garga on X, decided to take the reins as Yuga Labs' newest CEO. He is replacing Daniel Alegre, who became CEO last April. In a lengthy post on X, Solano said that he wants to prioritize the utility of Board Ape Yacht Club NFTs and recreate a space for the magic and crazy shit that first made it popular. The focus is on the other side, metaverse and video games. I'll let you guys read this on your own, but there's no mention of Proof or Moonbirds in this post. With the acquisition of all of Proof's assets, the team, and the intellectual property, Yuga is allowed to bring Moonbirds into other side. But some people are wondering about the intellectual property angle of it all. Because Moonbirds is a CC0 project, meaning it gives intellectual property rights to the public, not the NFT owner. So anyone can distribute, remix, adapt, build upon the material in any medium or format with no conditions. Moonbird's NFTs were not always a CC0 project, and when Proof decided to essentially revoke the intellectual property rights from holders without asking them, it was a whole thing. <laughs> so now people think that Yuga Labs might change this up, because in another of Greg Solano's posts on X, he said that Yuga wants to solve the CC0 move, which he called a mistake. So this led others to think that Yuga might give owners their IP back. Since Yuga Labs was one of the first NFT projects to popularize issuing an IP license that grants commercial rights to its NFT holders. First with Board Ape Yacht Club and then with CryptoPunks and MeBits. So leveraging the rights granted to them by Yuga, BAYC holders have since launched restaurants, comic books, food trucks, video games, hot sauce brands, music labels, production companies, and more, you name it. But Yuga Labs still owns the copyright in the Board Ape Yacht Club NFTs. The company just permits holders to own the digital artwork and grants them a license to exploit that digital artwork. The problem with CC0 is that it cannot be revoked. So you would have to transition to new contracts and essentially remint NFTs. Or if any changes are made to the artwork, then new IP could be given to holders. But I don't know how probable or necessary this is. We'll see what happens. But in the meantime, let's welcome two guests coming on Crypto TV today to comment on everything that I've just said. So stay tuned. Our two special guests today on Crypto TV are Hugo Filion, who is the co-founder of Flare, and we have Tyler Scharf, who is the comms lead at Crab News. How are you guys today? Thank you for coming on. Very good, thank you. Yeah, great, thanks for having us. Yeah, it's a great day in Dubai to talk about all things blockchain. So first, I want to start off with just brief intros. If you could just give us a brief intro of um, what Flare is. I know you guys have a bunch of products, but try and like keep it short. <laughs> and what your role is. And same for you, Tyler. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I'm Hugo, uh, co-founder of Flare. Flare is uh, the blockchain for data. Uh, it's essentially uh, the idea of removing the centralized aspect of oracles that are currently serving the ecosystem. So we've built an entire blockchain where the validators are essentially the data providers. Uh, and that is for price data, Web3 data, and Web2 data. Okay, amazing. And Tyler, if you could give us just a brief intro. Yeah, Tyler. Um, so what I do at CrowdMuse is managing the comms. And basically, uh, we are a marketplace for digital items. So, you know, like fashion, for example, you can create an NFT that represents, I don't know, a t-shirt. Okay. Um, and it's also a marketplace for composable IP. So artists can come and put their work on chain and then enjoy royalty streaming from other artists using it. Okay, amazing. Yeah. So we're going to get more into your respective companies and roles. But first, I wanted to just ask you guys what you think about this AI token boom that we've seen this past week. I think it's all, well, mostly thanks to OpenAI's new product, Sora, for text to video. Do you think it's fair that, or not maybe not fair, but do you think it's, it's just that just because we have this new AI product, all these AI-related crypto tokens are pumping? Uh, so people often call blockchain uh, you know, a product in search of a use case or a technology in search of a use case. 
Uh, when we think about it, I think AI could potentially be the biggest use case mm. for blockchain. That said, the idea that a centralized AI system issued, you know, created by OpenAI rallies tokens that have absolutely nothing right. to do with it <laughs> is um, a very strange one, but is testament really to the speculative nature of the industry. Mm. Okay. What about yeah. you, Tyler? What do you think? No, I totally agree. I mean, people are always looking for narratives to drive price runs, but um, I mean, I think, you know, the whole AI use case is a very interesting one. Um, I was an early supporter of Tau BitTensor. Yeah, um, that has the highest market cap right now. <laughs> is it? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I remember, because like my, my mother, she did a thesis on AI in like 1993 or something. Okay. And I called her up and I explained the business model to her and I was shilling it to her when it was like $20 a coin, right? And I was like, Mom, this thing's, and she's like, hmm. I don't get it. You Wait, know? when was this? Uh, this was like a year ago. Okay. Whenever it was, yeah. So then, you know, I, I had a little bit of it, but um, yeah, I misplaced my private keys because they changed from the, they had a polka dot substrate. Oh no. And then they changed it to their Nakamoto network. And then I just can't find it, right? So oh it's my gosh. my best and my worst trade I think I've ever done. Yeah. Oh man, I'm sorry. I really so. hope you can recover that somehow. <laughs> we'll, we'll see, yeah. I mean, there's possibly one way about it, but um, to be honest, yeah, like, I think, like I agree, it's a little bit overhyped, but still, um, I thought that it was an emerging narrative because no one has really thought about that yet, and I thought that they were a little bit ahead of their time uh, in terms of like how they were trying to develop the infrastructure for decentralized neural network training. Okay. Um, but I personally, that's why I called my mom, is because she, you know, <laughs> yeah. did the work on machine learning in the early days. So I was like, you know, is it possible to actually work? And uh, for for a while, it did nothing, right? And I remember. People kind of wrote it off, but then recently it, it's well, taken it's, off. It's kind of like Axie Infinity, right? No right. one really took it seriously until it was really serious. Well, because it made a lot of people money. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's that's a good point. Like you said, for a while things were quiet on the AI narrative front, even though it's been a, it's not a new technology at all. Mm -hmm. But I think it was actually another one of OpenAI's products, ChatGPT, that kind of put it on the map again for everyone. And everyone and their mother was talking about AI. Well, it's because it's, you know, that's what my mom says, like, we've had AI for how many decades? But the thing is, we don't actually have it as an app that people can use. Mm. As soon as it's something useful, it's like, wow, I'm doing this much faster, then people realize that it's actually life changing. Yeah. And I'm sorry to hear that you have your funds locked up. But Hugo, do you have any horror stories in the crypto world? <laughs> Not, not of my own. No? no. Okay, um, that's good. That's lucky for you. But I'd say about AI, I think you know, we take we, we have a slightly different view on, on AI in, and bl the blockchain sort of nexus uh, and why it's interesting. Um, we think that blockchain can make AI specifically better, mm. as in it can result in better, more accurate, less dangerous models. Um, that's what we've been working on uh, at Flare. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about that and what products you got going on. Uh, that's uh, not something we're disclosing oh. at the moment. <laughs> okay, then what can you tell me about Flare? I know oh, you I have some new announcements about, so that F came F up. Flare and AI <laughs> is a totally separate thing. Oh, okay. Um, uh, but but Flare is the essentially blockchain for data. Uh, we have essentially three what, what other people call oracles, but we call them data provision services because oracles are traditionally centralized in the space or or have very, very low decentralization and no guarantees of safety at all. Um, so there's basically you know, no reason why uh, an Oracle provider to, say, Ethereum uh, has to give an honest answer. Mm. And there's very uh, little uh, downside for them giving a, uh, you know, a malicious answer. They're, they're not, you know, on the whole, they're not staked. Uh, it's basically a, a sort of entirely trusted service. Okay. We thought that model was absolute nonsense. <laughs> um, and the problem with, you know, centralized models, uh, as we saw with the banks in 2008, is that when they go down, they take everything else with it. And there is a capacity for the existing centralized Oracle providers to take Ethereum down with it, mm -hmm. as in destroy the DeFi ecosystem. I doubt that will happen. But it's certainly not uh, it's certainly not a zero probability thing. Uh, so we thought, okay, how do we make data provision in a uh, in a decentralized way work? How do we do it in a way that's safer? How do we do it in a way that has many many contributors uh, and they have something at stake if 
if they're essentially being uh, corrupt or malicious. Uh, and that's what we ended up with Flirt, which is a blockchain using consensus to arrive at essentially um, uh, the, 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 the various different data provision services. And we've been slowly kind of un unrolling that thesis and the technology behind it. Uh, on Wednesday, we put out a, a governance update that moves our data oracle from 15 series to 1,000 series, uh, moves it from updating every three minutes to 90 seconds, and gives a, an optional one block update. So you can get an update every single block. OK, um, let's, let's break this down yeah. a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> so you say it's a blockchain for data and what does decentralized external data provision actually mean I know Google came in recently a month ago as a new data provider for Flare so can you give me just some more examples of so how to, to users give you an, to give you an example it means that Google isn't providing the data that people's smart contracts use it means that they are partaking in a consensus algorithm whereby there's a hundred players all providing that data and the network aggregates their data uh, and does so in an honest and decentralized way. Often, if you look at Oracle providers, they may have two or three entities, maybe five or six at most, mm -hmm. basically contributing data. But they're not staked. Uh, they're essentially, there's no uh, recompense for them if they provide bad data. You can't go to them and say, you provided bad data, my DeFi protocol lost a fortune, mm -hmm. and I'd like my money back. And they go, yeah, thanks a lot, goodbye. Um, with with Flare, it's uh, essentially about reputation, it's about being staked, it's about using the substrate that we know provides decentralization and safety to provide good data. So the idea behind that is to obviously replicate what already exists with data services and to go further. So price data like crypto prices, stock mm. prices, commodity prices, so you can use that in DeFi. Uh, then we have a proving mechanism to be able to prove things from Web2 APIs onto Flare, oh. again using staked, uh, using the validators in a staked format so they're all you know they're all um, essentially they have something to lose uh, if they are corrupt they lose the value of their stake because uh, if they create essentially an adverse condition for the network the value of the token falls so essentially it's about incentivizing you know in the ways that we know how to do uh, which is like a pretty tried and trusted model at this point um, you know being able to provide data onto chain for instance you know potentially with um, things like carbon credits and those kind of things being able to prove that there has been a you know reduction in carbon by a certain you know a certain uh, industry or a certain entity okay in AI you would also validate the fact that the model is doing what it says it is and it's a safe type of approach to it, right? right so the reputation absolutely. would be on the line not to provide some kind of dishonest or um, incredible data. Uh, and we see that as a, as, as a very big growth area for what sure. we're doing at Flat. Yeah. Okay, and then how does this newest upgrade differentiate itself from the original version? So the original version was uh, essentially what you might call a, you know, an MVP, minimum okay. viable product. It was slow. Um, it was using a lot of the, it was built primarily on the Ethereum virtual machine, which in itself is pretty inefficient. Uh, so what this does is it scales it massively. It scales mm. it from 15 data series, what, you know, one five to a thousand uh, with, with no additional overhead on the network. So that's quite, uh, no additional overhead on the EVM, which is, is quite, we're quite happy with where, yeah. where that's gone. Okay, amazing. And do you guys think that we can ever achieve a truly decentralized world should we like aim and strive for a fully in blockchain enabled decentralized data world <laughs> i think it has a lot of utility in data i think I, i'm not sure what a truly decentralized world means but ultimately governance. government yeah. Yeah. governments are always going to have the monopoly on on power unless mm. uh blockchains yeah. start building their own actual physical armies which i think is unlikely okay well i think that you know it's, it's also the problem of tyranny of the majority as well, which is what a lot of, you know, political scientists talk about, is you can't, like, people cannot stay informed on everything, right? <laughs> right. And it's this is also the, it's also the reason why there's uh, voter apathy in DAOs, right? Because mm. if you don't own enough of the token for the vote to actually right. influence your you net worth, care. you don't care, right? So most, in, most mm -hmm. DAO participation is extrinsically motivated by the value of that token and that protocol, where no one really cares about the outcome they either vote because they think it will make them eligible for future airdrops, 
or they vote because they own a significant portion of that token and it's going to influence whether right. that is going to appreciate value. They need value. incentives, yeah. basically. Yeah, so I mean like with data, yes, definitely. The more decentralized, the less risk of failure because there's no mm. you know, single point of failure. Um, but with governance types of things, I think that certain, you know, you can have councils, right, that make certain decisions at important points. But then, like, you know, if we had streaming democracy where everyone just like voted at everything they saw around them in the world, you just open your smartphone and be like, no, yes, no, <laughs> right? Then that, I think that would just devolve into chaos. Well, now we have all these prediction websites. Have you guys seen that? Prediction markets? Yeah, yeah, prediction markets. Yeah, but that's just another form of gambling. Yes. So, yeah, that's fun, but it's just another way to make money off something or lose money, depending right. on how right you're, <laughs> yeah, how wrong you are. All right. So Tyler, let's get a little bit more into crowd news. Are you guys dealing with any of these narratives right now in the digital goods marketplace world? Um, yeah, I mean, what we did, so recently we've done a few drops, one with Optimism for On-Chain oh. Summit, um, one with Base for uh, Art Basel Miami, mm -hmm. and several with Farcaster with their new frames uh, thing, which has actually been getting a lot of traction. People are quite it excited has, about it that. It has, Are you both on Farcaster? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, am, you go, I, oh. I haven't. I haven't posted anything yet, but I'm. I'm lurking. Okay. Well, we'll we can follow each other after yeah, this. Everyone, go follow yeah. Hugo and Tyler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Farcaster. I don't know. I mean, it was kind of like you know, this is a cool little pet project of some big VC that's just gonna like, you know, generate some attention. But then, no one really took it seriously. I mean, I was an OG on Farcaster. I DM'd. Uh, What's his name? Dom? I can't remember the founder's name, but I DM'd him to get on there back in those days. Yeah. And then I was participating a bit. I was just like, this is kind of cool, but it's just like, you know, Silicon Valley tech nerd click that just like <laughs> people just talk about these things with each other and then kind of faded on and off, right? Because you only have so much attention for some social media. Right. Well, there's too many platforms nowadays. Exactly. Yeah. But then once they introduce this like native frame where mm -hmm. you can mint and like customize and feature things, it exploded yeah. and like there was all kinds of little, I don't know, interesting, like you can use it for art, you can use it for different, what was it that they were selling? Uh, oh, the Girl Scout cookies. Girl Scout cookies, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like you can get creative with it. Yeah, so. that's what made it go viral. That's how I yeah. found out about it. Yeah, yeah. Those cookies. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, with, well, so with CrowdMe is what we're doing is basically, um, I mean, I see, like we kind of see the creator economy evolving more into a place where um, creators are able to spend more time and effort on doing their art rather mm -hmm. than building a brand. Because when we had the introduction of like the whole, it kind of started with like MySpace, Facebook groups, Instagram, TikTok type of things, right? Where you build this influencer type of economy, but then uh, it takes like a very entrepreneurial spirit in order to succeed there. Cause right. you have to dedicate a lot of energy to like marketing, yeah. outreach, sales, BD. You need a real business. Accounting. Model. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> either you, you know, invest a lot of money up front, hire a team and then just like scale it out like a real business or you multitask and you're basically like a jack of all trades. Mm. Right. And lots of influencers have, you know, scaled because they're very dynamic. They're very like multifunctional and they're able to do these things. Um, but a lot of them struggle with that because they just, you know, like artists don't like shelling themselves, right? A lot of artists for them, it leaves a sour taste in their mouth to go and sell themselves. So like, you know, in the old days, the Renaissance model of business was like a very talented artist gets sponsored by a patron and then he, the artist just gets paid to create art, right? right? right. So they do nothing but just create art, 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 art. Mm -hmm. They don't own their art, right? But then they're able to just focus on their passion. So we see an evolution of that where artists are kind of coming back to the renaissance of being able to focus more on their passion because when they put their work on chain, what happens is um, the blockchain provides the provenance. So it shows who created which work and who it belongs to. Mm -hmm. um, and then they get royalty streaming as other people use it, right? So let's say I create a nice design for a t-shirt and then you come along and you see it and you think, oh, that would look really well if I just kind of like twisted this a little bit and put that on a pair of shorts, right? <laughs> and then as you sell that, then the money, let's say 5% of the royalties come, come streaming to, back yeah, to me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's composability of IP, 
But the blockchain itself is not enough because there's obviously a lot of legal work to be done as well, right? Right, especially when it comes to the intellectual property and the, yeah. the rights of the holders, yeah. So definitely. there's contracts and contracts behind. The blockchain is just a layer of infrastructure, but then that IP is composable where people can kind of like adapt it to where they need it. And then there's no dispute of like who made it and where it came from because right. like the existing court process for dispute resolution of IP is so expensive and so long that any kind of like up and coming artist doesn't even doesn't bother, do right? Yeah. Like in fashion, it happens a lot where they create something and then a big fashion house steals it. And then it's like, what can I do, right? Their lawyers are a hundred times smarter than mine. I don't have the money to take them to court. <laughs> so good luck, right? Then they just complain on Twitter. Hugo, do you have any thoughts on anything Tyler has just said? NFT world, NFT market? I was just wondering if the global nature of the NFT marketplace sort of ensures a global clearing price for art. I think, you know, in the Renaissance, it was very hard. You were stuck in, I don't know, Turin, Milan, whatever. <laughs> yeah. right? You had a very small domain, you know, a very small area in which to sell your stuff, right? Um, and, and also information asymmetry. Exactly. It didn't travel, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I was wondering if it just makes the market like 10 times more efficient or a thousand times more efficient. Well. That's when there's so many platforms and marketplaces yeah. out there, I don't know how much more efficient it is. I don't know how much more efficient it could get. But yeah. Well, well, I mean, like, <laughs> highly illiquid assets, when you add enormous, I and mean, we saw what happened with Blur, right? And you add enormous amount of liquidity to it or options for bidding and asking, right? Mm -hmm. Then what that does is price discovery happens a lot faster, and then there's less information asymmetry and then I guess, sure, we approach true value, but then that kind of takes away a bit of the speculative fun at the same time, mm -hmm. right? So I don't know. But then at the end of the day, art is eye of the beholder, right? Yeah, yeah. So, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. Exactly. That's what they say. So do you guys own any NFTs that you are proud to be part of, like communities that you're proud to be part of? Do you have any? <laughs> I, I own some NFTs that were issued on uh, our Canary Network Songbird. Oh. Um, I own a couple on Ethereum. Uh, there's some uh, very fun cat-based NFTs that I own from uh, our own community. Okay. Is, uh, but on the whole, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a big NFT collector. All right. What about you, Tyler? Yeah, same here. I mean, honestly, like I didn't really... I, I understand the attraction, mm -hmm. right? Because it's kind of like... Well, I mean, it's existed on the internet for years. They're right. basically virtual cognitive niches, right? They go on Reddit, you can find them, right? Yeah. But then the, the NFT is just the status symbol of being a part of that group, right? Well, especially so, the PFP movement, yeah. Yeah, yeah, huge. yeah. yeah. But um, no, I mean, I got rid of most of them. I, I guess really? I was an early supporter of Treasure, DAO, so I have a small brain, a few small brains, but those were, um, those were free mints. Okay. And I liked the community because it was a very, it, it turned the whole thing on its head. It was a bottom-up community like Loot was, right? Where they built an entire, like, you know, metaverse thing, but then obviously the whole metaverse play-to-earn narrative didn't turn out too well. Yeah. Um, but the way <laughs> that the community <laughs> kind of, like, more holistically came together was quite nice, and it was very, uh, it was very supportive, right? Okay. And, uh, yeah, I, I like those guys because they're quite... Uh, you know, interesting how they kind of took the top-down model of like you pay to mint and then you expect the, um, for example, like, I don't know, Yuga Labs or Pudgies to develop something and then you trust that they're going to run their business well to appreciate the value of your NFT. Whereas here it was like free mint and then mm. community build something together and like 95% of those, 99% of those models failed because there wasn't enough coordination, right? Right, right, or yeah. users. <laughs> or I, users who I care. I have a, yeah. a Lil Pudgy that I love. It was a birthday gift, actually. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so one last question, guys. What have been some of the biggest lessons that you've learned from working in the blockchain, Web3, crypto space that you can share with us? Short term, everyone cares about narrative. Um, and if you, we, as a, as a project, we, we were kind of pig-headed when we came out and we were like, oh, well, we're scientists and we've got really <laughs> smart people, you know, and we under, we under appreciated how much work there was in getting the message out. Mm. Um, I think as we've grown, we've become better at that. Uh, when, nowhere near as good as some of the um, 
let's say, less savory projects out there uh, who are able to basically, you know, dress up something that is not very interesting very, very well. Um, marketing. <laughs> uh, marketing is an incredibly important part because ultimately you're building a financialized social network, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so uh, it has a social element and I think that was a lesson we learned and, 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 and are still learning. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely getting better at that and you know, hiring for those roles as well. Okay, and what about you, Tyler? What have been the biggest lessons from working in this industry? Yeah, quite similar, actually. Um, I mean, yeah, everything has a financial value, so people kind of automatically assume your value based on that, right? Their first impression is your chart or your floor price, right? <laughs> um, but then be careful of the hype wave, right? Because the hype wave uh, can destroy you, mm. right? Because it can massively run up expectations. And then if you're not able to deliver, then it will crash you back down. And then any kind of chart will look kind of like a, oh God, what happened there type of thing, yeah. right? <laughs> so um, when, when you kind of do this whole like skyrocket and then come back down enormously type of movement, then people are like, well, pump and dump or Ponzi or, right? <laughs> right. They assume the worst, right. they may not know, right? Yeah. And um, like the hype wave is really, you, you can't ignore the hype, the narrative, the marketing, the story, because that's kind of like what the average person tells their friend about you, mm -hmm. right? Beyond the actual tech or whatever, right? So, you know, the, with all of these AI coins, are they actually gonna be useful? We don't know, but people are talking about them, so obviously they're important, right? So you can't just ignore that completely, mm. but then you can't get carried away in that because that will die off as well. So. Yeah, you know, if you have, if you invested, you know, a hundred dollars and it turned into a million, probably time to exit, right? And think <laughs> oh. about like, you know, just because hype proceeds, or hype will always front run the price. So expectations will go up enormously and then very few projects will be able to keep pace with that, right? So a few of them manage to keep pace for some time, but it, it, you eventually burn out, right? Yeah. So yeah. managing that is difficult. Good and points. also presumably to avoid more boating accidents. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. So to close out, if you could just tell our audience what's the best way to get in touch with you guys and to learn more about your respective companies and projects. Uh, you can follow Flair on Twitter. Probably the best place to go for it is at Flair Networks. And myself, I'm at Hugo Fillion. All right. And Tyler? Yeah, so CrowdMuse is at CrowdMuse on Twitter and on Farcaster as well. And I'm at Ty Sharf on Twitter and then at Tyler Sharf on Farcaster too. Yeah, and we'll put all these links in the description below. Thank you guys so much for your time today. I learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you. All That's right. Great. Thank you. And please stay tuned for the crypto report coming up next. Bitcoin is currently trading at $51,102. Ether's price is at $2,938 today. FET is up 62% this week trading at $1.11 today. And Render Token is up nearly 43% this week, trading at $7.11. That's all for today, folks. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure to give this video a like and check out other Web3 TV coverage on our page. And go follow Hugo and Tyler. I'll see you guys later.